This video will discuss the wave functions of the harmonic oscillator. So we have our Schrodinger equation, h psi equals e psi. So in order to solve that, we needed to specify a potential energy function for our system. So we have two atoms here, m1 and m2. They are covalently bonded to one another with some uh, s potential energy specified by a spring constant k that gives v of x equals 1 half kx squared where x equals the displacement away from the equilibrium bond length r naught, where our bond length is the value r. So when we solve that Schrodinger equation with that potential energy function, we get that the energy of our system equals h nu times the quantum number n plus 1 half, n being a quantum number starting at 0 going up to infinity as an integer. The nu is the frequency of that oscillation, which is 1 over 2 pi, square root of k, the spring constant, divided by mu, the reduced mass of our system, which is the reduced mass mu is equal to m1 times m2 over m1 plus m2. Okay, so those are all the energy levels that we've been discussing in their spectra and the potential energy but what are the wave functions of the harmonic oscillator? So the wave functions of the harmonic oscillator depend on x and they depend on the quantum number n that we have, lowest value being zero. So they have three parts. First, we have a normalization constant. Then we have a value called a Hermite polynomial. And then we have a part called a Gaussian function. So in two out of the three of these, you'll notice a quantity alpha showing up. Alpha equals the square root of the spring constant times the reduced mass over Planck's constant time over the reduced Planck's constant h over 2 pi. So alpha equals square root k mu over h bar. So the first part here we have the normalization constant which is 1 over the square root of 2 to the n times n factorial times the fourth root of alpha over pi. That's our normalization constant. It's different for every value of n. Unlike particle in a box where they were the same for all, now they are different for every value of n. All right, the Hermite polynomials, the value that we're substituting in here for this C, which is this very strange Greek letter, but Physicists seem to be fond of using this symbol for this particular case, so I'll use it as well in case you come across it. The value of c that we substitute in here is the square root of alpha times x. So everywhere you see a c, substitute instead square root of alpha times x. So, as so okay, and then square root of alpha times x, I've written a note to myself, would equal the fourth root of k mu over h bar squared times x in terms of these constants up here. All right, there is a generating function for the Hermite polynomials, which involves derivatives of e to the minus c squared multiplied times e to the c squared and minus 1 to the n. That's if you wanted to actually generate them. Generally, what you look up and what you do is look them up in a table, something like Wikipedia, Wolfram Alpha, your textbook, who knows. So these Hermite polynomials are equal to based off of uh, the order that they are. They're the same order in polynomial as the quantum number that you put in here. So h0 equals 1. h1 is, if we say this in terms of x, would be 2x. h2, 4x squared minus 2. h3, 8x cubed minus 12x, etc., etc., beyond there. So you get terms of if it's even, you get even terms all the way to zero. If it's odd, you get odd terms all the way to zero, but it's just a polynomial, just a sequence of numbers. Okay, so that's the middle part. And then the last part is a Gaussian function, e to the minus x squared over two. All right, so this alpha value controls the width of that Gaussian. If alpha is very small, then you have a very diffuse Gaussian. If alpha is very large, then you have a contracted Gaussian, a very tight Gaussian. So as k goes up or mu goes up, both of these get very tight. And as k goes down or mu goes down, you get a more diffuse, more spread out wave function. So our psi 1 is a Gaussian times a constant times a constant, because the zeroth order Hermite polynomial is a constant. 
So psi one just looks like a regular old Gaussian function. Psi two is a Gaussian times a linear polynomial, which is a gives us two lobes, one positive, one negative. Uh, psi three is a Gaussian times a second order, sorry, psi two. This should be psi zero, one and two. I'll correct that in a second. All right, so psi zero, one and two, this should say psi two is a second order polynomial with three lobes. So this gets very difficult to draw and actually show any kind of fidelity. So I'm gonna look at an animation that I have on Desmos, links to this graph in the description. So here's psi zero. It's a Gaussian function that I have in terms of the Hermite polynomials, the Gaussian normalization constant. So as I change my spring constant, notice the potential can get tighter and my, my Gaussian gets tighter. As the potential gets more spread out, as K gets lower, my Gaussian spreads out. I have the energy levels in there as well. So this is the first, this is the first solution, so psi zero. Um, for the mass, as the mass goes up, we get less quantum behavior, the energy level goes down, the wave function gets more contracted. As the mass goes down, more quantum behavior, more spread out. Okay, so that's the effect of the, the mass and the K. What about psi one? There's our two lobes, as I mentioned. I can turn on its energy as well. for psi three, four, and five. I'll throw those on there as well. All right, we see the two lobes. Psi two, it's multiplied times a second order polynomial. There are three lobes. Psi four is gonna have four of them. This graph is gonna start getting crowded. Psi five, you see all five of them on there. Okay, so you see all these trends as how they can get more contract or more diffuse depending on the value of K and also depending on the M, both of which contribute to that alpha in there. And then we have the three parts that come into play, the normalization constant, the Hermite polynomial determining the number of lobes you see, and the Gaussian, which is our central behavior of being oriented towards the origin where X equals zero.